So I'm thrilled that we have Walid Salama joining us today. Walid is a senior research geoscientist and the leader of the minerals and water team at CSIRO in Perth, Western Australia. And he's joining us today to chat about his research on mineral exploration in areas covered by Permian glacial sediments and sand dunes. So thank you so much, Walid. It's absolutely wonderful having you. Um, thanks just for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, and thanks for everyone attending uh, the presentation. Um, today, I'm going to give you a presentation about the mineral exploration in areas covered by Permian glacial sediment and sand dunes. Number one, when you see the first slide, you can see this, that most of the, at least Western Australian part in the over Yellingarni Cretan is something like that, especially flat surface covered by vegetation, soil. That's what we see, very rare to find our crop. Um, before we go for, uh, Next slide. I will start the, the, the presentation by acknowledging uh, the Wujuk people of the Nungar Nation, uh, the traditional owner of the land I'm presenting, um, and pay my respect to the elders and past and present. Also, I would like to acknowledge my um, expert in the regulars, my colleagues, uh, Charles Pat Race, Ms. Rabia Nand from CSIRO, and the amazing work done through CRC Lim in the space of the regular geoscience and mineral exploration research. For all of that research, you can uh, access through the link uh, of the CRC Lim website. Um, there's a plenty of open file report about the work that we have done, uh, of, of what the CSIRO uh, regular team has done over the, mostly over the 20 years. Before we go, when you see the geology of Australia here, what you can see, you see uh, most of Australia is covered by Phanerozoic uh, uh, sediments, uh, mostly in this bluish color. And um, the Archean Cretons here, such as Yelgan, Bilbra, Golar Creton, um, in part of Australia, even when they are in this location, they are deeply weathered and covered by sediments. This light yellow and um, the brown color is mostly related to the Proterozoic basins and the origin in Australia. As you see, or roughly mostly, um, most than 75% of Australia is covered by sedimentary color. The area we are talking today is actually that those areas that's covered by Permian and the Julian sand. And when you see that, you will find a plenty of um, previous map, plenty of areas such as Patterson uh, province uh, or Patterson origin, and most of the uh, eastern part of the Yilgarni Creton and northeastern uh, Albany Fraser, all of this area are prospective for mineral deposit and also covered by Permian and the glacial sediments. Here an example of the landscape from the satellite image showing the plenty of sand dunes running in, in north, west, south, east direction. And one of the uh, important uh, mineral deposits at Telfa is within that area of the Permian cover. You can see here um, the map of the Patterson uh, province where you can see the Permian cover in blue and Mesozoic cover on the eastern part in green. And that's covering a number of uh, uh, Patterson province and also where we found a number of deposits like Nifty, uh, Telfa, and uh, also uh, Reno, um, and uh, some of the recent discovery, like a very young discovery. So there's a plenty of those deposits and prospect under this Permian and the Eulian cover. Another example we see here is a Tropicana down in the Albany Fraser area. You can see also the same landscape, uh, sand dunes, and also under this sand dune, plenty of uh, Permian cover. And that's mostly in the north and east part where the Tropicana is existing here. And Groyer along the same line also covered uh, in the eastern part of Yaman, uh, of the Yilgarni Creton under Permian and the Eulian cover. So that gives you an example that that's a landscape that we are exploring. Another example here on Yaman terrain, which is the main topic of the present, uh, of the present presentation, which is that zone where Yamana terrain, part of it is under very thin cover and the majority of it is under Permian cover in blue. And recently, as you know, uh, the Gruyere gold deposit has been discovered in 2013. And that's a landscape again. You can see um, the land, uh, the sand dune, and sorry, the sand dune, and also that example of the sand dune uh, stable by or stabilized by the vegetation. That's an example from those, one of the sand dunes what you have. I'm giving you that slide to give a summary and the conclusion of what we will see in the next few slides. 
If you see this diagram on the top, that's what we normally see the Permian cover in, in a yellow color. And sometimes it is truncated by tertiary paleo channel or uh, Cenozoic paleo channel. And on the top of that, we have this quaternary sand dune on the top. What we normally see in those areas like a Tropicana or uh, in Yamana or Patterns Province, we have the Permian cover mostly is overlying a uh, wizard bedrock. But in the northeast of Yelga and the Crater of Sandak, Agnew, Lansfield, you see the Permian cover is sitting on a fresh rock. We have two different strategies of exploring these two terrains. Number one, if we go for those areas where we found that the Permian cover sitting on a wizard bedrock, normally we can see two different uh, uh, location we target. Number one is to see any hydromorphic dispersion coming from the mineralization that could be res residual enrichment in the saproli, but the groundwater process can move the metal through the weathering through the cover up to the surface. And I will show you the example how we see this in one of the prospects in Yamana terrain. In the second type, we can see also some mechanical dispersion along that interface. We can see transported and only very close from the mineralized source based on our understanding of the topography of the unconformity. But when we go to the northeastern Yilgan crater, for example, here, when we see the cover here is sitting over fresh rock, we normally look for the indicator minerals. We see because the lower part of the Permian cover is fresh and sitting on a fresh rock, there is no interaction between the cover itself and the underlying mineralization. However, because here we will look for the interface sampling or the unconformity, uh, sampling above the unconformity. And here, one of the vertical profiles showed, for example, gold and sulfur is rich in the lower part of the Permian cover, which is dominated by diamic tides. The gold and, and sulfur, because plenty of sulfide grain, persist and become abundant over the mineralization. And if we sample the, the um, the interface, we will see that nice anomaly of zinc and gold, for example, over one of the deposits. But in those areas, again, what we found um, the cover of our wizard rock, we see the effect of the groundwater here, but showing the Permian cover have a, a redox front, some sort of ratiation, dissolution, some cavities within the cover. And when you see the gold, for example, you can see enrichment of the gold within the Permian cover that, that can pick up at the surface. And you can see the enrichment is up to 100 BBB gold of uh, at near surface. But as I said, indicator minerals can persist here. You can see some of these indicator minerals, sulfides, sphalerite, calcopyrite, pyrite in the system, or could be also coming from, from fresh rock here, somewhere here, like gold, silver, this example of what we see. Let's go for the Amman terrain, as I said, which is a major topic today. The Amman terrain, it, this is uh, the two main greenstone belt, the Rusi Hill greenstone belt, hosting Groye, and the, um, the, the Amman greenstone, uh, sorry, the, the Amman greenstone belt, uh, which is hosting a number of prospects here as well. I'll show you example today about Santa Ana Smoke Bush and Tobin Hill prospects. But when you can see here in that diagram, that's the, the blue line is a line is a line where the Permian extension from the from the west from the east to the west. All of this area here is covered by Permian, by Permian and English and 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 Julian Sand. And why Yamana terrain? Yamana terrain is mostly undercover and has got almost roughly thirty years of exploration, with the only recent discovery by Gold Road, who this work is mostly made for. Um, discovered the Gruyere in 2013 uh, under uh, tertiary cover, actually value channel sediments, and uh, is discovered mostly by, by the interface sampling, one of the one techniques that we use here in this, in this topic, in this presentation. So if you see this map of the geology, what we see in terms of that value topography, uh, or sorry, the current topography DM, that the map we see here, it's mostly dissected landscape with valleys you see here in the deep blue area and the area that looks like plateau, dissected plateau and some area like topographically high. So that white color is high in topography, the blue color is the low in topography. When you see the distribution of the regolith in the area, 
The yellow color that you see here is dominating the area is mostly of the sand dune and sand blade, Eulian sand blade. And um, this blue color here you see, it's a, it's a lacustrine sediments. Um, and also those one of the red is mostly exposed rock. The calcrete running in the valley or valley or in the valley is in purple. Some of this um, red is mostly exposed rock and sapphire. But the main dominant area here or the dominating color is for sand, plain and sand dune, where a number of prospects today is Tobin Hill, Small Cruz, Santana, and even Roye is under this Eulian sand plain. When we do some of these traverses east to west to see how the cover is changing from east to west, what we found is something like that. What we found, the bedrock in dark green wizard to the saprolite in light green, and in area you see the Permian cover overlying unconformably this type of the weather bedrock, or sometimes is completely eroding saprolite sitting on a fresh rock. And on the top of that, we have a layer of ferruginous gravel in, in an orange color. On the top of that, we have the red color representing the Eulian sand blade. In some areas, which is very important, you have the Permian cover, the, 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 there is no Permian cover, just the wizard bedrock overlying by, overlying by the, the Eulian sand. We need to understand what sort of material we will sample from each area, as we see in the next couple of slides. Number one, let's show you how the cover it looks like and what sort of feature we see. Number one, from the bottom here, the saprolite sitting on a fresh rock is overlying by the lower part of the Permian cover is mostly a sand and gravel, coarse grain sand and gravel, and mostly carbonated micaceous. And the upper part of the Permian cover is actually, as it shows here, mostly it's ferruginous, uh, cavernous, appreciated, because it's uh, alternated, altern like rhythmic alternation of sand and clays. Uh, so it's siltstone and sandstones, and this cavity due to the dissolution of the groundwater. And the uppermost part is looks like highly appreciated like that. So you can see the effect of the groundwater, how it, it plays with the, with the cover, especially the Permian cover. The topmost part of this Permian cover can be uh, turned into a basolitic shape. And this basolus can be formed in place, stay in place, or could be reworked and re-cemented, as you see here in the ferruginous basolus, re-cemented forming ferricrete. Understanding this type is very important because you can, Consider it as a residual or transported, and both types can give you true or false anomaly on the surface. On the top of that, we see that type of the Eulian sand. That image that you see on the right here, it's one of the sample of the drill hole. You can see the ferruginous gravels overlain by Eulian sand. That Eulian sand, as you see in the next couple of slides again, there's some new type of basalis formed autogenically in place within the Eulian sand. Very, very important and very good sampling media as you will see when we come to how we sample and what is the chemical analysis of this were giving us. If you go to Tropicana to give another example to show you the similarity in terms of the same cover, Tropicana and the Havana is two deposits uh, in, in the area that said covered by sand dune, this is DM, and both of them have the same cover Permian cover overlain by Eulian sand sitting over wizard bedrock. That's example of Havana, that's example of Tropicana. If you see one of the sump there, you will see something similar, which you see Eulian sand and ferruginous gravel at the bottom, and that's overlying this type of the Permian uh, cover as well. And that's of one of the basalis on the top of that Permian cover, just underlying the Eulian sand. So we have similarity in the same type of that cover Permian and the Eulian sand. Coming back to Yamaha Naturae, how we see the samples that we are going to talk about from each location. Number one, the first location in the area where we see the residual weathering profile, no Permian cover, but Eulian sand. That's one of the sump where we see, sometimes we can see the, the image in number D, which is Dury crust, massive Dury crust. It could be reworked and weathered like this, so in the sum you can see gravel. When we get some of them, then you see the image B. This cut polished the slab of those gravels. And this type of material is distinct from any basalis formed in Permian sediments and Eulian sand 
because it contains hematite, grotite, and gypsite. Gypsite aluminum oxide, uh, sorry, hydro, uh, hyd uh, aluminum hydroxide, which is formed normally in a deep weathering terrain due to the, 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 the water and, and mobility of water through the weathering pipeline. So that gypsite is only characteristic of that type of material. The new sampling media that we found within the Eulian sand plain here is this nice, very little bezolus that you can see it here. And this bezolus we can see when we, sample, when we do the soil sampling. You can see that's from the soil sampling. But when we try to collect this material, we collect some of them very easy from the surface, but we need, in some cases, some drilling up to three meters to get it from uh, some location. But this is completely different. This is mostly quartz grain cemented by iron and aluminum oxide with some little kaolinite uh, uh, spheres dominated by this red color of aluminum from the element map and the iron oxide cement. And this quartz is represented by silica here. So this is a completely new, different type of sampling media. We haven't seen that in Eulian sand before. Um, just to going to tell you something very important, the chemistry here and some of the elemental uh, ratio is very important to understand this cover. What is residual, what is transport? For example, that's bedrock, mostly mafic rocks over uh, weathered to saprolite, and that's Permian sediment, and that's basalis. It could be related to the Permian, could be related to weathered bedrock, could be related to anything else we will see from the chemistry. When we use rubidium over zirconium ratio, for example, we can completely show that we will pick up the unconformity between the Permian cover and the underlying uh, residual bedrock. That's for all drill holes, pick it up very easy. And I'm sure that could be working for Albany Fraser or even possibly for the, for the, for the Patterson as well. Titanium over zirconium, which we use to separate the Permian cover over northeastern Nilgam near Agnew, doesn't work in that terrain. But the most important thing that give us very good control on that unconformities, the European anomaly. European anomaly is mostly positive in the bedrock like mafic rocks and it's weathering growth. You can see it here above one. But in the Permian cover, it changed it to negative European anomaly giving indication that most of the Permian cover is derived from a felsic source rocks. Going again to the, this business on the top, we have another shift to give us that this business is not related to the underlying Permian cover. The main reason for that, if you got, and we, we, and we already got some anomalies in this business, you can see if it's coming from the underlying rock or coming from the weathered bedrock somewhere coming from a lateral source. That's very important to understand, but let's start with the actual work. The first, uh, prospect we have is smoke bush. That's the example of what we have. The smoke bush is a subvertical golden mineralization hosted mostly in the mafic rocks, overlain by Permian cover and the Julian sand. The mineralization itself is dominated by gold and arsenopyrite and pyrite perotite, and that CT scan done by gold road have gold above up to one, uh, course again gold up to one millimeter. You can see from these yellow dots and uh, arsenopyrite in, in red and pyrite perotite in, I'm sorry, as, um, arsen, pyrite and, and perotite in green. Team map show that the mineralization is dominated by arsenopyrite in these big grains, so that we see. Chemistry telling us that gold and arsenic and sulfur are the main three components of the mineralization. We have a group of elements in blue color in the table less than 50% PPV, 50 ppm uh, um, concentration, vanadium, zinc, uh, tungsten, antimony, cobalt, copper. The more other growth element is le less important, less than five ppm each. So we can see that we are normally targeting gold and arsenic in, in, in anything in the cover if we find. Here, give you a very nice example of what we see near surface. Number one, lateritic gravel at the bottom. That's a Permian, uh, that's sorry, the Eulian sand. What we done, one sample we got that represented by this blue bar from the lateritic gravel, one sample from the isogenic business in Eulian sand represented by this red bar, the matrix around this autogenic business represented by the green bar, 
and some uh, loose Eulian sand from the top here, represented by the orange bar. What we see? Gold, two times in the oestrogenic bezolus, more than the underlying lateritic gravel, which is the, the host of the gold. Then we know that now gold could be enriched from that gravel or even the dewy crust up through the Eulian sand and concentrated in the bezolus. But comparing the bezolus with the surrounding matrix, you can see very complete trust in those change, very enrichment or very high enrichment in those elements in the Eulian or the bezolus in the Eulian sand compared to the surrounding matrix and the underlying rack. On the other hand, the iron, arsenic, bismuth, indium, lead, uh, silver, tin is concentrated in the ferruginous gravels, but is still present in the Eulian, uh, the, 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 the oxygenic bismuth in Eulian sand, but at lower concentration. So trying to do that systematically, we collected 70 soil sample as a bulk, as you see it here, from 70 soil sampling arranged over east with direction over smoke bush. And as I said, it is not easy for us to collect that sample from that normal soil sampling. We got Gold Road help us to collect those visuals at between one and three meters from the surface. And what we and separate we done separation of the more than 2,000 micron to get that visuals from that less than 75 micron to get that uh, material. And we analyze less than 75 and more than 2,000 in these so in these samples. What we got. In the bezolus and in the fine soil fraction, which is less than 75, is not less than two, the normal fine fraction of CSIRO, but that bezolus and that soil fraction give us very nice concentration, just surrounded by this black dotted line uh, or the, the circle, which give high concentration over the mineralization in both of them in the soil and in the bezolus. But the concentration in the bezolus, as you see here, is factors of higher than this in soil. So you can see the up to 135 here, we can talk about 19. And given also the way of, you can see if that material easy in the field compared to just separate the fine fraction, um, which should take some time as well when you do that. And that's one of the traverses showing you how the concentration in the second traverse show the concentration in both type of fraction and the concentration as well. Uh, arsenic is doing the same, also good anomaly on the over the mineralization here and in also in the in the fine fraction. So it's a similar way, there's no change. So arsenic gold. The rest of the other element that we see in the mineralization, which is less than 50 ppm or even less than 5 ppm, wasn't that clear in the anomaly. This doesn't make any anomaly over, over the surface. So which give us indication that this material is reflecting exactly the composition of the of the mineralization. When we do uh, some laser ablation ICBM mapping to see the gold and arsenic on those uh, orthogenic visuals in Eulian sand, we can see micro bellets of gold here and some dots, nano or micro crystalline grain within this bezolase, one of the bezolase in Eulian sand, and also arsenic is also concentrated in that in that uh, bezolase. Just to be sure that um, that 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 material is still have the gold within it. We got this example from the one of the samples that have the highest amount of gold. That gives us important indication to understand what is the behavior of the gold and arsenic in that, in that environment. For this reason, we have done something in here, which is do six types of partial exit fraction to analyze gold and arsenic behavior through the cover. This six type of partial exit fraction, you use distilled water, tetrasodium biophosphate concentration 0.1 mole, and hydroxylamine hydrochloride 0.1 m and 0.2 m concentration and potassium iodide and potassium cyanide. Each of these type of partial extraction is targeting uh, uh, the, how the gold is behaving with, with which material. So we found, for example, here we take three samples from the business, three samples from the from the from the from the soil, and done this for gold and for arsenic as well. What we found, most of the gold in the soil and in the bezolus is moving as a particulate gold and, and also soluble gold with the majority extracted by potassium, iodide, and cyanide. But arsenic is very, very interesting to be mostly associated with or extracted by tetrasodium biophosphate, indicating 
it is associated with organic material. So we went and opened part of the basilisk and tried to see what is going on inside. We see plenty of microbes, fungi and bacteria, as you see here. And I, I will show you something interesting here that part of the gold is associated here with iron and manganese also. We haven't tested that one, but we are going to do more work on that. But quickly to show you, that's image here. We've done ADX spectra in this microbe and on the surrounding matrix. What we signed in spectra number 30, that have some manganese in, the, in, the, in the, this microbial form. But on the other hand, the surrounding matrix doesn't have manganese. So this bacteria has a control on precipitation of manganese, which is actually picking up some of the gold. We haven't explored that in detail, but we are doing at the moment DNA to know what is the microbial communities is controlling that. And if there is any actual control on gold and arsenic mobility using the microbes. Now, what else we can see or we think about? We went to see the vegetation because the vegetation is the one that is, can also suck some of the, those elements through because there is some role of the organic material in the soil. What we see, two traverses over the mineralization, and what we see, very nice arsenic anomaly in the, in the leaves of the eucalyptus trees over the mineralization over one of, that's example of the, one of them, but both of them, these traverses showing this very nice arsenic anomaly. Remember the arsenic anomaly was extracted by uh, sodium tetrapyrophosphate. That's giving us also that the, 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 the vegetation is picking up that element that is associated in uh, or extracted by the pyrophosphate. Gold was only giving one spot, which is not convincing, but is still picking one spot over the background. But the most important and very amazing story here, what we find the tungsten only in three samples in these three drill holes where we found the cover is less than uh, 10 meters or sometimes no cover at all. That anomaly, we, in the beginning, we said it could be some of contamination, but we be sure that we did all of the correct procedures using avoiding any steel uh, milling, was a gate milling to get that type of, of the anomaly. And actually, if we go back to 2009, we found the same anomaly. Uh, we found, uh, for, for gold, we found uh, Mel Linton, our colleague, found that anomaly in the gold in the, over the Havana uh, deposit in the eucalyptus and in the litter for gold. And some uh, movement of the, of the anomaly down the slope from the main mineralization. But the most important thing, again, he found the, the, the strong arsenic, uh, sorry, tungsten anomaly over the Havana litter of the eucalyptus trees. You can see it here very clear and here as well in the eucalyptus on the, in, the, in the litter. So that's give indication that it's also present in different places. Recently with the gold road as well, there's also some tests of the eucalyptus in another prospect that has been done using the eucalyptus tree and the only best find that, that was found is tungsten. Not only in the eucalyptus, but also could be also in, 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 the, in the spinifex that could be, that is also dominated in the terrain and you can find it everywhere, even uh, in, in the Patterson province. Going back to another prospect down in the uh, Albany, sorry, in, in the Yamana terrain, I'm giving an example for this prospect that you will find a different story. How this basil is giving another good story. Very little mineralization or very narrow mineralization. As you see here, we do the same exercise along four east-west lines soil samples, basilisk, and do the same exercise. The topography here you see here from east to west along that line, here from the west to the west along that line here, and to the east here we found that the, the weather of bedrock, that's a saprolite, and that's the, the Permian cover, Permian cover to the east sitting over fresh rock. From the north to south here, that's south direction along this line, you see the same way, so the, the, the Permian over North and to the west is sitting on a fresh rock, but in, in the other area is sitting on a weather bedrock. Why I'm using that one? To see, to show you that traverse. That traverse of the drill hole line crossing the mineralization, what we see is the gold actually moving across the Permian cover, giving you great up to 100 PPP gold near the surface. 
And you can see here as well, very close to the mineralization and started to decrease a little bit away. And we have some of the gold along the interface. What is the importance of that? We normally see enrichment of gold and arsenic in the upper mottled part of the, of the Permian cover and represented or also concentrated in the Bezos and in the Union sand on the top. But the interesting story here that I would like to say, we found very nice gold anomaly over the mineralization, but we didn't find arsenic in that particular prospect. Why? Why? We have asked ourselves why we didn't see the arsenic in, in, either in soil or in the bezoles. We went, let's see the mineralization there, the, the intersection of the high grade. What we found actually, we didn't find arsenic in the mineralization because the main sulfide was mostly pyrite and pyrrhotite and there was no arsenopyrite in that mineralization. So with this case, what we actually see in the bezoles and soil is the actual reflection of the, the mineralization. If it's giving us gold and arsenic or only gold because there is no arsenic in the mineralization. We went and do laser ablation again for the gold. We see plenty of gold of those bezoles on the top of the Permian cover. You can see in some places the mapping giving us very high concentration of gold in the PBB, in the PBM grade along, along that scale bar. And remember that what we saw, uh, what we saw in that line, we have a cover of Permian that reach up to 40 meters of Permian cover, and we can see some concentration within the Permian cover. The third and last prospect here in Yamana is a Santana, which was promising in the beginning, but there is a third story happening here that need to be taken in consideration if you're exploring in that terrain. We have the visuals on the top, as you see in that terrain, we, did, we do the same exercise, soil sampling, visualist separation along these two lines, and that's the sort of material we see and what sort of the landscape we see. What we found, a cross section coming from that, uh, that area that we see in the map in the previous slide, coming from the, from the north down to the south, and that's a cross section what we saw some topography from here, that's a cross section crossing topographic high down to valley filled by sand dunes and going down. And that's what we see, Permian cover, traditional business, Eulian sand, Permian business is disappearing further to the south. We collected the material here, we started to analyze, but before we go, we didn't find any anomaly, as you will see in the next two slides. Why that? I'm interpreting here. When we do the mapping, we found something interesting. The matrix itself have a different mineralogical composition from the bezoles. What we see in this image H, there's some mica and feldspar in the matrix is not in the bezoles itself, which gives an indication that we have a different matrix from the bezels, which give indication that this material most probably is moving, or it could be originally transported from somewhere else and the landscape inverted. What we see here was actually transported in the past and not related to the mineralization, even if it is over the mineralization. And that's the example of the golden arsenic in the bezels and in the, um, and the soil for the two Traverses, you can't see anything clear over the mineralization, except some enrichment to the, to the east of the mineralization along that traverse here in the gold, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the soil fine fracture and in the, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, by the stronger collision and the, yeah, that's another, 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 another sample is not the same. So what we see here, that traverse, we see it here, uh, we found something interesting. There's no enrichment in the top except in just something like this soil anomaly, which is not directly over the mineralization. But we see enrichment along the unconformity actually here. And that unconformity is extending 500 meters down. The enrichment of the gold at the base of the Permian cover show, showing us some enrichment to the, to, the, to the rest of the mineralization for 500 meters. Some soil anomaly which is not convincing, we don't rely on because of transportation of the bezoles. That's in general of a three prospect in, 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 um, in Yamana, but the idea of not finding anything on the surface, if we didn't find, or we find uh, example, which we can't rely on that visualist on the surface, something like example from Patterson, 
we have the same similar cover like a Permian and Eulian sand on top, but the interesting stuff that, that's example from the Reno deposit, and that's from the Calibar deposit in the Patterson province. And what we see important here that most of the mineralization that we see is starting to stop here, based on the analysis from the companies, at that unconformity, at that un and another deposit similar way. So something here give us that if we use the interface sampling in that terrain, it could give a very large full distal footprint compared to the size of the mineralization, especially if you understand the topography of that unconformity. I'm assuming also that in the patterns in province, you will find drastic topography related to the fault block blocking. Um, so you can see some traps if you have done interface sampling along that one or sampling the bottom of the Permian cover, or even do some sort of separating of the heavy minerals, you can get wide distal footprint in that terrain based on that idea of the interface sampling. And also you could find some subtle in, in enrichment within, within the Permian cover. I know that the Permian cover in that terrain is a little bit very thick. It could be reaching up to 200 based on that. We haven't done actual work on, on that terrain, but uh, what you can see from, from the ASX announcement of the companies is showing that the Permian cover can reach up to 200 meter, but there is no actual work have done on looking for that Permian cover in that Patterson origin. The conclusion of that, we have the three prospects here. Um, we have the snow push area of residual uh, uh, with a profile for overlain by uh, even sand away from it, not very far from it, the Permian cover become thick. Material can erode from the residual residual forming, forming, uh, sorry, forming that layer of originous gravel still over the mineralization. Um, it could form the main part of the enrichment of the gold that uh, dispersed together with uh, arsenic to enrich in the Eulian, uh, the business in Eulian sand. Some initial could also become in the, in the vegetation that in the smoke bush in Topin Hill, we have that Permian cover that we have direct evidence of mobility up to the surface. At, to at Santana, we have an interface sampling. We did show enrichment along the interface or the unconformity. Soil anomaly and basil wasn't that convincing to work along that line. So that briefly about this area. If you give me another 10 minutes, I will just quickly go to another way. I ask Jessica to be patient with me. Another five minutes more. Very quick on another way of looking of the other Permian cover on the Northeast Yilgan. We were here at Yamana terrain. If we move to Lancefield at the bottom of the Dukton mining, that's the Dukton land uh, greenstone belt, which is similar to Agnew, other places where the Permian cover is mostly Permian diamectite. The, the glacial direction is very important to, to know. It's normally in this area from the previous work to the southeast direction. And that's an example from the Lancefield uh, uh, North Prospect uh, by due to mining. And that's an example of, of the two traverses we have done. What we see here, we see that the Permian cover is sitting straight away on a fresh rock. The lowermost part in gray is fresh. The upper part is weathered, and that is covered by tertiary siltstone and some transported soil in red color. What we see here, as I said before, titanium over the conium look very good on finding that type of the unconformity. Why are we looking for that? Because when you see the, the, the drilling, how it looks like from the diamond drill hole, you see the Permian cover is sitting with a very erosive contact on the underlying mafic rocks, which is the host of the gold in that uh, prospect. And that's the folders of the, of the, of the, of the Permian diamond types. You can see it here. But from the ship trace, it's very hard to pick it up. Why that? Because when we go to that line, that's the unweathered Permian diamond here, and that's underlying fresh rock. Some of the fresh mafic rocks fragment can be uh, incorporated in the basal part of, uh, of the Permian cover. And also the color itself doesn't change. So you need to be very careful looking like that. But high logger can also, uh, CSR high logger analysis show that the white mica is stopped at that plane in all the drill hole, which is very good tool as well. I, I didn't presented here, but it's a very tool, good tool to, to, to pick up that uh, boundary very easy. But chemistry as well, titanium or zirconium is for all the whole, pick it up very easy. 
The basal part of the of that cover, as I said, have some gold enrichment inside, some sulfur uh, enrichment as well. Um, but as I say, the lower most part is unreserved part of the feldspars, uh, represented by enrichment of the sodium and potassium. I'm sorry. Sodium and potassium oxides still in it. We can see also that very weakly weathered to strongly weathered uh, to the top. So the weakly part, the weakly weather part, is still have some feldspars and mica still resistant within within the cover. The calcium and magnesium uh, oxide is mo mostly dominated in the lower most part as a carbonate cement. And this sulfur sulfur is present as a detrital sulfides and also thromboidal sulfide cement, pyrite cement. You can see the mineralization here. What we see gold arsenic, copper, zinc, cadmium, moly, and silver, tungsten, and lead in the, in the mineralization. But we didn't see here from the chemistry. What we have done, we started to sample the unconformity. What we found actually, we found gold and nickel and cobalt, arsenic and zinc and cadmium enrichment over the mineralization compared to the background. And you can see along one of the traverses here in, this, in some of the drill holes, so that's very easy uh, and clear over the mineralization to pick up those some of those elements. But because this interface sampling, it doesn't show any halos, a very big halo, just picking up the mineralization at the boundary. If we did, if we did that exercise, let's show you the mineralization when we do the mineralogy of that. What we found in the mineralization, that's a team mapping, show the mineralization. We would like to know what sort of minerals we have based on the chemistry. We have found gold in the, in, in the, in the blue and it's in the red, arsenopyrite, pyrite, perotite in the light green. In some other sample, we found uh, uh, nickel, uh, nickel uh, sulfide like uh, pentlandite as well, uh, but it's not common. And we have shellite, we have also found the um, uh, chalcopyrite, sulfide, galena, all of those elements we have found in the mineralization. If I see example again from the mineralization, shellite in the purple. And we have uh, uh, some of the uh, pentlandite here as well, and some of the gersodophyte and cobaltite as well. This mineral that we found in the mineralization. That's an example of one sample that we have collected from the lower um, most meter of the of the Permian cover. We done this for the 36 drill holes. We collected the sample. We come to the lower most meter of the fresh, and with a direct type, collect the heavy. The one, kilo, uh, one kilogram from the sample, we do the heavy mineral separation, we got that. And that's the example from one of the sample from the cover. What you see, you can see plenty of sulfide green still fresh. And that's the example of that location. You can see arsenopyrite, chalcopyrite, pyrite, sphalerite in green, and some shellite, um, and this plenty of it. And when we, when we do that, Along one line, for example, that example here, we see the distribution of those uh, indicator mineral, which is mostly sulfides. You can see some enrichment over the mineralization and some of the background. Because we have limited by the amount of drilling, we didn't find, we don't have drill hold more than 500 meters from the mineralization to, to see how big this dispersion in, in the indicator minerals in the base of the cover because we don't want it to stick to miss something, something similar like this, based on the interface sampling by itself. And that's an example of the mineral that we have separated from the cover. You can see all the different minerals we see in the mineralization is present in the cover. The last slide here today is the model for that. We assume that the original surface of the fresh rock hosting the mineralization in that unconformity, which come here and then coming like that and then up to the surface. Because the Permian glacial is eroding the topographic high, putting all of that material in the topographic low area. And also the topography is irregular here. So there is a high chance if there's a mineralization in the high area to be dumped and trapped in the very proximal low topographic areas like that. What we found is enrichment of the indicator mineral over the mineralization because the mineralization is sheared zone and the shearing making value topographic low in the, in, in the area. So when we collect the sample from the drilling hole cutting across this area, we found enrichment of this sulfides here and started to be decreasing to this, this way. 
But as I said, we don't have enough information based on the limitation of the drilling. We also know from the, from the mineralization that we have also uh, some of the hydrothermal alteration coming with the mineralization. And we noticed that also in those indicator minerals, we found chloride, calcite, albite, cortis, microcline, muscovite, titanite, rutile, gypsum in the mineralization and also in the surrounding mineral. If we got uh, like a co composite indicator mineral grain, we still see the same, the same uh, mineral assemblage. So the most important thing to understand the topography, if we have a rough topography, we expect proximal source of the mineralization. If we have a gentle flat surface, we expect distal footprint in that terrain, but at Lansfield and also at Agnew, we have something similar to that landscape. So if you exploring in those area within the Northeast Yilgarn region, you have most or the high potential to find something very close to the mineralization if you tackle this indicator minerals because as I said, it's very close to the source and doesn't move. And also the texture of it is more angular and composite grains and it's not rounded. You give indication this is very, very close to the, to the, to the source of rock. That's the last uh, slide and I would like to thank you. I'm sorry if I took too much time from you and thank you. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that.